Summer Theater. Uh, what, huh? You got a bar? Let's put on a play. What the heck? Well, so many people to congratulate for this. I'm going to breathe. It's warm in here. Uh, after things get going, we'll open the doors and hopefully there'll be a cool breeze. Uh, I just want to make uh, everybody aware of, of the enormous contributions that were made for this, not only uh, receiving family heirlooms from friends and neighbors in Conway, the, 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 it was the Curry family heirlooms, fly swatter that I borrowed, this lectern, <laughs> this lectern I stole right out from under the valedictorian of Frontier, uh, they didn't mind, and uh, I want to thank all the families that uh, indentured to us their firstborn to help build all of this stuff and uh, and I we're not taking any more kids all right I don't care how much <laughs> uh, a lot of people to thank for this uh, the 250th committee of course uh, for, for and you uh, for helping us put this on as part of our 250th celebration here um, I'd like to uh, openly thank two entities that really, really made this possible. And the first is the Conway Sportsman's Club. Huh? And, uh, for one, for letting us have this beautiful facility, uh, not only to rehearse with, but uh, the volunteer help, literally, that built this stage, from scratch is, is many of the members and the volunteer help that they had that built this incredible pavilion. I think this town has a, a reason to be very, very proud of this association. And I want to thank a few people by name uh, from the Sportsman's Club who gave, uh, I'm talking a lot of time and efforts to making this possible, and that's uh, Bud Ware, Bruce and I just seen back there. Lee Chase, Ronnie Hawk, and the entire Baker family. <laughs> uh, the other entity to take, uh, you know, putting six plays on, even though they're short duration, takes a lot of work and effort. And the other entity to thank is Silverthorne Theater. Now, Silverthorne Theater, uh, out of Turner's Falls, uh, and, and run by uh, Lucinda Kidder has really uh, taken over for the play, supplying us with directors, actors, plays, programs, our lighting system, uh, and everything else. So I'm going to put in a plug for them because they're back there and in the intermission, take a look. They're putting on another uh, one of the unknown Shakespeare plays, Stupid Effing Bird, this summer. <laughs> so if you get a chance, uh, give them a look. Now, the basics, the basics, the exits in case of an emergency, there, through these curtains, and through those curtains are the emergency exits. Please turn off all your cell phones now, and anybody with a tubercular cough or anything, please leave the premises now. <laughs> there will be a 15 minute intermission at which time you can replenish yourself. We've got some great uh, meat brackets back there and all kinds of snacks. And the turtlets are outside, as they say in Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, it, it, we, I chose a variety of plays, uh, not necessarily, it, because next weekend, by the way, which uh, is going to be spectacular, uh, uh, I didn't want to spend time doing reenactments or this or that. Uh, I just wanted to give us a nice uh, variety of theater. But it's, it's a shame that, that, that the early settlers and pioneers couldn't be here to see what we have. Malachi Main. Is this your work? This must have taken years. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and residents of Conway, 
I have said it before, and I will say it again. Would you put your horse on those boulders? No. I, no, but I see many of you have. <laughs> People say to me, roads? Roads in a country like this, with a new hill round every rise and a brook beyond that. Now, I answer them. I have my answer. Listen, I tell them. Is this a town? Sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this a town? Yes. yes. Of course it's a town, they say to me. All right, okay. What's a town? Now they don't answer. So I answer. I'll tell you what a town is. It's a meeting. A meeting of minds. And how do you get a meeting of minds? A meeting of men and women. <laughs> and how do they meet? By the ways. And what are the ways? Roads, Roads thank you, third row. <laughs> <laughs> roads. I tell them, roads, roads, roads. That's what a town is. Men going back and forth on their occasions, passing each other and not always passing, pausing sometimes and speaking, correspondence, sharing of ideas and of stories. Mr. Haith. Uh, yes, sir, uh, yes. Yeah. Would you mind reading the letter? This one? Yes. OK. <laughs> it's addressed to occupant. But again, I guess that's me, right? I get a lot of, OK. This letter is from somebody, I think, uh, Mr. Maynard, it was before your time. William Warren. William, oh. William Warren. And William Warren wrote to me in this letter. He said, if you are a town, you fight the trees. I mean, what, he says, what I think about is sunlight, letting the light in. I mean, when William Warren was around, there were virgin trees here the size of baker's pancakes. <laughs> and, and letting the light in, he said. He says here, my wife complains there's never a patch of sunlight in her kitchen. Now, William Warren had an ax, a hoe, a chain, one cow, and a bungtown coffer. Now, that's all he had, an ax, a hoe, and a chain, and even the cow had to work. He, he says here, uh, a man gets to hate trees. Trees as big as barrels, bigger, ash, birch, oak, pine, locust, hemlock. No end to trees, he says. No end to roots either. You grub the roots out, heave the boulders, and then the branches, he said, they won't burn. Not that season. And you split the trunks. Try to. Let the winter split them. It's hard work, he says, long work, one man and an ax. If the ax breaks, he said. He says here, you can't let up. Trees are wilderness. If you want a town, you fight the trees. A town needs sunlight, open meadows, pastures where the pines were. An ax, a hoe, and a chain. It took him seven years. Seven years to clear his meadow. He says here, finally, he says, I saw the sunlight on the floor, and Mrs. Warren had sunlight in her kitchen. It's a life's work to keep the open. Keeping the sunlight. It's worth it. And that's what a town is. It's the open. It's the sunlight. It's the roads. It, it, it's, it's the sunlight. <laughs> It's the community, it's the meeting of minds, it's the stories. And with that, I bid you farewell.
Things aren't exactly dead around Conway, I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, theater is many things. Uh, a couple years ago, as part of my rehabilitation uh, from parole, I was forced to take uh, several classes and uh, we took them at the Waitley Ballet, <laughs> where I heard a lecturer who taught us about the meaning of theater. And so seeing we just built a theater, I thought, hey, why can't we get this lecturer to come here and tell us all about theater? She was sensational. Uh, but she has a <laughs> another lecture tonight at the ballet. <laughs> so I, I, I hope, Mrs. Sorkin! Yes! You oh, you're here. Thank you. oh. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Sorkin. general sense of nausea. <laughs> or nausea, as Jean-Paul Sartre might say. <laughs> Perhaps over a cup of espresso in a Paris bistro. Oh, how I love Paris in the spring. <laughs> or I would if I'd ever been there. <laughs> Mr. Sorkin and I haven't done much traveling. Maybe after he dies, I'll go somewhere. <laughs> We go to the theater seeking the metaphorical drama mean that will ease us of our nausea of life. <laughs> of course, sometimes we become nauseated by the drama itself, and then we're sorry we came. <laughs> Especially if it uses the F word and lasts more than four hours. <laughs> now, I don't mind a leisurely play, but at 10.30, I want to leave the theater and go to sleep. <laughs> now, occasionally, I will use the drama mean instead of the drama, and I only wish someone would renew my prescription for second all. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, uh, we have the word theater, which is from the Greek word Fiesta. And nowadays we have the word reestat, which is a device by which we can slowly dim the lights in one's house instead of snapping it off with the flip of a switch. Thirdly, 
we have the Greek god Dionysus, the last syllable of which is spelled S-U-S in English, but S-O-S in Greek. The letters which in Morse code spell HELP! <laughs> Dionysus was the Greek god of wine and revelry, but also the father of modern drama as we know it. <clears throat> now, the Greeks went to the theater in the open air, just as the late and wonderful Joseph Papp used to make us go see Shakespeare. <laughs> now, Shakespeare's language is terribly difficult to understand for those of us in the modern age, but how much easier if there's a cool breeze and it's for free? <laughs> if I have to pay and it's hot, well, I don't much like Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I sh shouldn't say that. He's a brilliant writer, and I look forward to seeing all 750 of his plays. <laughs> Although perhaps not in this lifetime. <laughs> uh, but back to the Greeks. <clears throat> The Greeks went to their open-air theater, expecting the drama they saw to evoke terror and pity. We have enough terror and pity in our own lives nowadays, so instead of going to the theater looking for terror, we go looking for slight irritation. <laughs> and rather than looking to the theater to evoke pity, we go looking for uh, general sense of identification, as in, Evita was a woman, I am a woman. Or, Sweeney Todd was a barber, I go to the hairdresser. <laughs> or, poor Fosca, should really have those moles removed, I know a good dermatologist. That sort of thing. But did the Greeks really experience terror and pity? And if so, what was it in all that matricide patricide that affected them so? You know, I know that seeing Greek drama nowadays, even with Diana Rigg in it, <laughs> it really rather baffles me. It is so different than my own life. My life with Mr. Sorkin is not something Diana Rigg would wish to star in, even on PBS. <laughs> My life, I'm sorry to say, is not all that interesting. In fact, addressing you at this very moment is the high point of my life to date. <laughs> Might I have lived my life differently? Women of my generation were encouraged to marry and play the piano. I have done both those things. Is there a piano here? <laughs> I don't see one. But I might have played a sonata for you, or a polonaise. Uh, but back to my theme. Drama, from the Greek word drama. When we leave the theater, we feel drained. And if it's been a good night, we leave with a sense of irritation and a, a sense of identification with Evita or uh, Fosca or, or that poor Mormon woman in Angels in America. <laughs> and so drained, we return to our homes, we get into our nightgowns, we adjust the rheostat from light to dark. We climb into bed next to Mr. Sorkin. And we fall into a deep REM sleep, dreaming God knows what mysterious messages from my teeming unconscious. And then in the morning, we open our eyes to the light of the new day, of the burgeoning possibilities. Light. From the Greek word leukos, meaning white, and the Latin word lumen, meaning to illuminate. In German, de Licht. In French, la lumière. All art leads to light. Light. Plants need light to grow. Might people need art to grow? It's possible. 
Are people less important than plants? Some of them are certainly less interesting. <laughs> but there's something, some connection between light and theater and people and plants that I am striving to articulate. I, I think it has to do with photosynthesis, which is the ingestion of light that plants must go through in order to achieve growth. And you see, it's light again. Photo, from the Greek word phos, meaning light, and it connects to phosphorescence, meaning light given off, and synthesis, with the Greek prefix syn, meaning together, and the Greek word tithene, meaning to place, to put, photosynthesis, to put it together with light. We go to the theater desperate for help in photosynthesis. <laughs> the, the text of the play is the light. The actors help put it together, and we are the plants in the audience. <laughs> plants, lights, theater, art. I am feeling a sudden interconnectedness with everything. It's making me feel dizzy. <laughs> and dramamine, of course, is good for dizziness. <laughs> well, now, to wrap up. Uh, dear theater goers, I hope you enjoy your evening this evening. I don't really know exactly what you're going to see, but I'm sure it will be splendid. <laughs> oh, and if you are ever in Connecticut, I do hope you will drop in and say hello to me and Mr. Sorkin. Uh, he prefers that you call first, but I love a surprise, so just ring the bell, we'll have cocktails. <laughs> and I do hope you have enjoyed my humbly offered comments on the theater. I have definitely enjoyed speaking with you. <laughs> and I have a feeling that from now on, it's going to be harder and harder to shut me up. <laughs> and so, the high point of my life to date being over, I leave you with the plays. <laughs> Well, that cleared things up for me. I don't know about you. I hope you're taking notes. Well, this town is so loaded with talent. I'm going to call on someone who has been a world-renowned musician, Europe, America, and everywhere, and has become, and is becoming, and is, a terrific actor. And you'll see him more than once tonight. So, former Conway resident, his body left Conway, but his heart stayed here. Please welcome Chris Devine. Oh. fiddle tune for you. A really, really old fiddle tune. <laughs>
I don't have the band tonight, so I need your help. Can you clap your hands like this? children, splits property, and every once in a while, these people go their separate ways, whether they left in good terms or ter terrible terms, comes the awkward moment when uh, they run into each other. Well, such is the case in best in class. like no class reunion is complete without one. Well, still, it's been ages. Jack went tearing over there as soon as they made the first announcement. Oh, it must be 20 minutes. It looks like the photographer is having a hard time settling them down. <laughs> if my eyes don't deceive me, it looks like the class clown is up to his old tricks. Hey, Jack, cool it, buddy. You're making a scene. <laughs> is he always like this? <laughs> Some would say that you're the one making a scene. That was unnecessary. It's a wonder his doctor hasn't recommended Ritalin. I see you're still heavy into control. Jack is just being Jack. Fine, just fine. You're the one who has to live with him. I enjoy living with him. He can be a handful, but never boring. Unlike some parties I won't mention. Another five minutes and already you're repeating yourself. Wasn't that all covered in the sessions with 
what's her name, that marriage counselor. Oh, Dr. Margie, he doesn't understand me. He doesn't fill my needs. Still better. You got everything you wanted. You got the divorce and your little Susie. The divorce was not my idea. Huh, but you seemed eager enough to seize the opportunity when it came up. Living with Jack has rubbed off on you. Lower your voice, you're making a scene. Oh, as you say, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a crowd. Are they all from the same class? I don't think I've seen half of them before. A, it's just possible. Some of them were here when we were not visiting. You don't know everyone and everything in the world. And B, I think the management wants the picture for promotional purposes. The more, the merrier. Oh, thank you, Roger. I was almost forgetting what it was like to be corrected by you every time I opened my mouth. Thank you so much. I must have that. <laughs> Look, this is a day for them. Can we just put up with being in each other's presence and let them celebrate with their friends? You're right. You're right. It's their day, their reunion. Jack and Susie. Susie and Jack. So, how is... Susie. Ah, uh, you know, same as ever. Oh, you mean a Luke? That's not fair. <laughs> Susie is, well, you know, French. She can come off as being rather judgmental, but when you get to know her... No, you're forgetting. I knew her a long time before you came into the picture. Good manners, almost elegant, but oh, so demanding. Picky here, narcissistic. I was embarrassed at the way she treated the staff at the salon. Everything had to be just so. The nails, the hair. Uh, speaking of which, what the hell does she have on her head? You got me. The stylist called it a fascinator. Insisted she'd impress everyone at the reunion with it. Okay, I'm impressed. It looks stupid, but she impressed me. <laughs> it doesn't make up for that substandard hairstyling. Maria must be losing her touch. Uh, she hasn't been going to Maria in ages. Going to a new shop now, a little franchise in the mall. Just a simple wash and trim. And, of course, for the reunion, the fascinating. Susie, queen of the boutique spa, styled at a franchise with no one to do her nails. There was a coupon in the Sunday paper. It's really quite a bargain. Bargain? Huh. That must be the first time that word has ever been used in the same paragraph as Susie's name. Well, it seems that you have imposed your frugal lifestyle on your little Susie. Not at all, but I've been picturing. It would be better for your mental health not to run movies of us inside your head. Now it's being judgmental. That's sick. Just sick. Seems I can't say anything right, so I'm going to just go for a little walk. No, not before I do. <laughs> Operation. <laughs> mm, never post. 
not me, just stating facts. <laughs> boy, oh boy, Emily's got me on a schedule. It's exhausting. Sometimes I think that she only loves me for the sex thing. Oh, a schedule? Oh, American. How does this work? Well, she finds needy partners on the internet, and there goes my weekend. Into the car, off to dog's nose where, meet some bitch that I've never seen before, do the deed, Emily gets a check, back into the car, until next time. Ha! Oh, it's a dog's life! You make the little babies with strangers? Well, don't act. Well, don't act. Well, don't act so shocked. How do you think we got here, huh? Lines have to be maintained. Otherwise, how would you know a Jack Russell from a beach? Oh, well, uh, Emily, Emily and Roger, they did not do the research. They just breeded with each other. Well, that didn't work out so good now, did it? Did it? Oh, Emily, what was she thinking? Oh, Emily, we used to be so close. Our long walks in the park. Ah, lazy evenings watching the Masterpiece Theater. Ah, and then she goes out and meets Roger. And suddenly, poof, I am no longer the best friend. Roger's not such a bad guy. Once you get to know him, get to know him like I did. He can be a bit of a law and order guy, but I think that's why I was so good for him. I lightened him up. I taught him how to have fun. Also, but the things he would say to her. Oh, living too much for pleasure. Ugh, spending too much money. Ugh. And now I am stuck with him. Complete and total lack of elan. Well, <laughs> living with Emily is no bowl of kibble. No siree. No siree. I need someone to put me first. And you know what I end up with? She oversleeps. <gasps> And I don't need to tell you what that leads to. Ah, yes. Oh, not getting the walking time. Oh, it is the worst. And of course, we are the ones that get blamed. Oh, how did we get to this point? Well, they call it divorce. <laughs> and then they split the assets. The books, the car, the CDs. The us. Oh, Shaq, I miss you. You are crazy. <laughs> I do not approve of you, but I miss you. I, you too, you lovable, spoiled, snob. <laughs> I always put you as an ideal, something to aspire to. Mm. You know, since the split, <laughs> I think my manners have gotten worse. Jack, why are we separated? And why are we separated like this? You with her, me with him. Oh, unsuitable pairings. More thought goes into my weekend hookups than they put into placing us. Sometimes I think that she kept me just to irritate him for spite. Spite! Spite, 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 spite! Exactly. Exact amount. They wanted to make each other miserable by taking the wrong one of us. And then everyone is now miserable all around. Susie! Here's Susie! Time to go! Jack, here we go! Jack, no, I'm serious this time. <laughs> Raj! Raj! Here I am! Here I am, Raj! Did you bring the ball? Did you bring the ball? Emily, I missed you! <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, I missed you! Did you bring the ball? Did you bring the ball? <laughs> <laughs> look at your nails! Oh, do not look at my nails! So Roger does not believe in grooming. <laughs> I know, John, this is the first me ever, huh? <laughs> well, no! Tuition was wasted. <laughs> Just 
Oh, God! And in front of all the other families, too! What have we gotten ourselves into? Home! I wanna go home! I'm not I'm me. Me. So not me. Boy, what is it? You sound miserable! And I miss Susie! I want Susie! <laughs> also given it in combination with her sister to the world. I want you to welcome yeah. the eighth grade, Peter Newman and Katrina Neal. So actually, I'm, I'm going to sing with my own son, William Chalfin. Peter will be up here in a little while with Jen. Oh, yeah. wait. That's William. I'm sorry. Oh, William, I'm so sorry. I also, William's only in sixth, sixth grade, grade, whereas Peter's in eighth grade. Uh, I'll, All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go. That's William. He, he's in sixth grade. Ew! <laughs> Ew! You're good. All right, no, but you should be Sorry, I have to keep up with her. Hi, I'm Katrina. Woo! Yeah! And I'm William. Woo! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
true May you always do for others and let others do for you May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung May you stay forever young May you stay forever young May you grow up to be righteous May you grow up to be true May you always know the truth and see the light surrounding you May you always be courageous, stand upright and be strong May you stay forever young May you stay forever young May your hands always be busy, may your feet always be swift May you build a Sorry. May you have a strong foundation when the winds of change is shift. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung. May you stay. Apologies to William. I you sound great. Sort of a segue into the next. Somebody asked me yesterday, "What's your name, Mike?" I said, "I don't know." <laughs> well, it, it becomes a whoever named the Golden Years Golden was not any kind of a meddler. Just I'll tell you that. <laughs> and especially after you've been married a long time and. You get used to each other and the past comes tumbling back at you and you try to just enjoy the day and each other and well those problems seem to arise. Please welcome I'm Herbert. Um, Mary was a uh, way, way long ago. Uh, 
Mary was before Grace. No, she wasn't. She was. I should know who was my first wife, <laughs> goddammit, woman. <laughs> That's it. Just call me woman. We won't get confused. <laughs> it's not very flattering, but it's better than being called the names of all your other wives. My name's Muriel, and your name's Harry. Well, you see, you, you just called me Harry, not calling the kettle black. You just got me confused. You always could mix me up. Back when we were going to Europe and we, I... We've never been to Europe. That was Harry. You and I have been to Europe together. No, we have not. Uh, Grace and I went to Europe on our honeymoon. That, that was when I had money before... Women had taken it. <laughs> I went to Europe with you. You went to Europe with Harry. Ooh, I went to Europe with George, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'm Herbert. We've never been to Europe together. Singly, not together. I think we have, and, and you've just forgotten. Oh, I've got a perfectly good memory. <laughs> you can't even remember my name. <laughs> You know what? Venice. You and I went to Venice together. You're just ashamed to admit it because of the scandalous good time we had. <laughs> you know what? You loved me then. Uh, I didn't love you when you, you were having a, a scandalous good time in Venice with, with, with Harry or, or George or whichever one it was. Uh, which one was it? It was you. <laughs> I've never been to Venice in my life. Yes. Yesterday you said you'd never been to Chicago, but I proved you wrong on that one. Your second daughter by your first wife died there, and we went to the funeral. Uh, Grace? The daughter's name? Uh, uh, Grace's girl. No, no. Grace wasn't your first wife. Mary was. Were you there? <laughs> Once was enough, twice was more than plenty. I, I, I don't know what got into me to try the third time. <laughs> you were sick and too tight to hire a nurse, so you married me. Yeah, well, I, I got better, didn't I? Why didn't I kick you out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, no, 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 no. No, don't, don't cry. No, I don't. I don't mean it. You're always crying. <laughs> Took on something terrible, crying buckets at our son's wedding. Oh, took on something awful. We didn't have any children together. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't cry. That was Mary. I'm Muriel. Uh, it's no wonder I get confused with, which I don't. <laughs> you, you all the time saying, uh, Mary, you mean Muriel, Grace. I'm just trying to straighten you out. Well, I don't see what difference it makes. I answer when you call me Bernie. I've never called you Bernie. I may have once or twice called you Harry when I woke up all of a sudden, like, and, and didn't know where I was, but I never knew of Bernie. Bernie. Never heard of him. Okay. He'd be pleased to hear that. <laughs> carrying on with him when I met you. I was married to Harry when you met me. Yes, and carrying on with Bernie. <laughs> that, he must, cleared out. that must have been Grace. You were carrying on with me? Grace must have been carrying on with Bernie. She was married to Harry and Bernie? You said she wasn't married. No, no, no. You were. You were. Oh, what day of the week is it? What difference does that make? Oh, you can't remember anything anymore, you foolish old man. Bernie Walters. Huh? That, that's him. Who? Uh, Bernie Walters. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> you just said his name. Well, you've been saying it here for the last hour. I just repeated it. You said Bernie Walters. I said I've never heard of Bernie Walters. And besides, I wasn't married to Harry when I met you. If I'd been married to Harry, I wouldn't have looked at you. <laughs> My strappy man. May he rest in peace. 
And oh, <laughs> what he did in Venice. <laughs> oh, of course. Wait, you see, it, it was Harry in Venice. Of course it was Harry in Venice. Well, well you said it was me. You? You wouldn't have it in you to do a thing like that. A thing like what? Don't be jealous of a dead man. I've done my best to forget him, George, just like I promised when we got married. Uh, I'm Herbert. Do you keep repeating it so you won't forget who you are? <laughs> you, you just called me George. Oh, a hearing aid is a cheap thing. Oh, now, now see here, Grace. I'm Uriel. Oh, I'm just talking about me. What about you? Uriel. I'm Uriel. <laughs> I wouldn't call you Grace. Grace was, was, was soft and, and, and gentle and, and kind. Why did you leave her then? Why did she died? <laughs> Mary died. Your first wife. Grace drove you nuts, and you married me. I left Grace for you. <laughs> Very lovely. 
You said we were going to Florida, and I said, Grace, my mind is slipping. Well, it was. I've never been to Florida. <laughs> Let's just drop it. The seer sucker suit. I, I never owned a seer sucker suit. <laughs> you said it was the same suit that you wore when you ran away with Helen. And we had a long discussion about how ironic it was that you were wearing the same suit when you ran away with me. <laughs> Who is Helen? You were not. <laughs> <there. laughs> I, I, I was running away to Florida with you, and I was so old my mind was slipping, and then I couldn't remember. You're writing a lot of things that happened at different times together now, love. Why don't you just sit quietly for a while, George? Oh, <laughs> Uh, growing up, uh, 
I, I don't know about you, but there's been people in my life who we've had a very strange relationship with. Uh, it's almost, uh, what's the song, you gotta be cruel to be kind kind of a thing, where express love goes very, very deep, and yet some people will pull and tease and hurt to get that love out of someone else. But it's there for people that understand each other. And boy, I wish I had the best daddy. steps here. Can I look now? Okay, open your eyes right now. Is that him there? That's right. Why is he covered with a blanket? Well, he, he doesn't he, look like a pony. But he is. A $350 Shetland pony. Why is he laying down? Well, Why is he laying down? Is he sick? Why is he laying down? Lisa, I didn't want to tell you this. Why is he laying down? He is sick. He is. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead? It's a hell of a thing to have to tell your granddaughter on her birthday. Dead. A dead pony. We gotta face the facts. <laughs> you got me a dead pony for my birthday? A <laughs> dead pony for your birthday. What what happened to him? Lisa, I'm gonna be honest with what you. What happened to my pony? <laughs> You're 13 years old now, and I'm gonna talk to you like an adult. What happened to my pony? <laughs> I shot him. Oh my God. <laughs> About an hour ago, but now. <laughs> you shot my pony. You shot my birthday pony. I told you not to get excited, didn't I? <laughs> Answer me. Did I or did I not say don't get too excited? Why did you shoot my pony? I did not shoot your pony. He wasn't your pony when I shot him. You didn't even know he existed. He was a pony, for God's sake. Why did you shoot a pony? <laughs> he bit me. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't have to shoot him. You didn't have to. He was only a little pony. He didn't know what he was doing. You weren't there. You don't know the situation. <laughs> My pony is dead. I'm 13 years old today, and you gave me a dead pony for my birthday. I told you he'd me. But you gave him to me anyway. You took me out here to show me a dead pony. <laughs> oh, well, I thought about that. <laughs> I thought if I take her out here and show her a dead pony, that'll upset her. But if I don't give her anything, She'll think I forgot her birthday. <laughs> what could be worse than getting a dead pony for your birthday? Listen now, someday you'll have children of your own. I never shot a pony before. I want you to believe that. Never in my life before today. You hated my pony. You always hated him. I didn't hate him. I never even... You did. You hated him because you knew I loved him. Well, when I saw him, I liked him. I thought he was cute. You knew he loved me. And he could show his feelings. And you couldn't stand that oh no, because you could never love anyone. You're all bottled up. You keep your feelings all <laughs> your <own. laughs> And he could show his love. He could swish his tail and toss his head and lick my hand when I gave him sugar. And late at night, when I ride him bareback through the gray mountains, you never rode him. I just bought him. You didn't know. I used to sneak out late at night when you thought I was sleeping. I'd climb out the bedroom window and I'd run to the pasture. Pasture? What pasture? And smell my scent. He'd gallop toward me. I'd leap on his back and he'd 
galloping over the moonlit moor. Moonlit moor? With the wind in my hair. And now he's dead. You killed my pony. You killed Black Thunder. Black you killed the only thing I ever loved. I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did. You said you did. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> April Fool? But it's not April. It's my birthday. Ah, oh, then birthday fool. <laughs> Black Thunder isn't dead? Then who is under that blanket? Ah, uh, not who, but what? What, what is under there? Three guesses. I'm not guessing, you're me. You ruined my birthday. Three guesses. A candy bar. Uh-uh. A turtle, a big, gigantic turtle. Nope, two down, one to go. A rubber wrap. No. Then what is it? It's your sister. <laughs> what? It's your sister. It's Kathy? Big fat Kathy. <laughs> what is she doing hiding under there? And you said it was a what, not a who. Kathy is a who. Not exactly. <laughs> not exactly. Kathy? Kathy? It's a what? It's Kathy's body. Kathy's body? She's the one that bit me! <laughs> you shot Kathy? Ah, uh, my 30-30 Winchester. She had teeth like a damn one of grizzly. You, you gave me my dead sister's body for a birthday present? First you tell me my pony is dead, and now you tell me you shot my favorite sister? You are the meanest, cruelest, most vicious grandpa in the whole wide world. Double April Fool. <laughs> it's not your sister. I wouldn't shoot your fat little sister. <laughs> no I'm not guessing. You're mean, you're cruel. You ruined my birthday. It's the motorcycle you want. Uh -huh. The Honda? Uh huh. The red one? Uh huh. Really and truly. Mm -hmm. No April Fool. No April Fool. No Birthday Fool's Day. No. Grandpa, you're the best grandpa in the whole <laughs> And they tell me the work release program isn't going on. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have more to come. Great excitement. Uh, we're going to have a 15-minute intermission. Uh, I'd like you to take advantage of our uh, salon back there with all of our goodies. And also, 250th is selling a lot of memorabilia over here. And the turlets are out there. 15 minutes. Enjoy yourself.
you're having a good time so far. No. So I, have <laughs> I cannot thank uh, the uh, Sportsman's Club and the volunteers in Silver Point Theater. And don't forget, uh, before you leave, get, get your tickets to Stupid Having Bird. You got your tickets, you'll be the first to line to get their incredible t-shirts that are coming out. If you've seen their poster, you know what the t-shirts are going to look like. Well, onward with Conway's deep, deep pool of talent. Uh, if you have not been exposed to uh, this woman uh, before, you're in for a treat. And she has brought, hold on one second. Yes, Peter Newman, where the eighth grader uh, to accompany and play for us. Please welcome our own Janet Ryan. Thank you, and I'm actually going to bring one of my very favorite and long-running piano students, um, Peter Newman. This is Peter. I'm Peter um, to come yeah. up and. Uh, Play first. I'm Peter, as you may have guessed. <laughs> I'll be playing Song Without Words on a piano.
next weekend, during the big weekend, uh, T.J. Conroy has put together a list of musicians of which Janet and, and Katrina Neveals are, are a part of, but it's some lineup of entertainment that uh, the 250th is put together on our big weekend next weekend. So please come and attend. Well, uh, You know, we talk about our history, and, and, and as uh, Malachi Maynard said, that you know they were here very early, and the reason that Deerfield sent the people up here to populate what was Virgin Forest, that in, in part was to push the Indians that uh, met a comet and the others that had uh, fought against them out, and of course. Uh, who were the people that did that? Who were the people, the great, great, great grandfathers of the Boydens and the Wells and the other names that in this town? My own great, great grandfather came from Ireland. I'm sure everybody in this room can point back to some distance to someone that wasn't here in the beginning that came to this country. And I, growing up, I, I, many of us have had, uh, I've had people come into my life, mentors, uh, it's, and especially at a young age, when I was at a young age, some who, well, they weren't so much mentors as advice givers, and some were mentors that I listened to, but I didn't hear. And, you know, we all have that experience of how do we take advice or wisdom from somebody that uh, we care about. Well, I think the people on break at L.L. Bean can shed some light on that. <laughs> Maybe it is haram to say, I will ask my imam, but this thing called code? This thing called snow, which rises the heights about your ears? I think, I think God has found great fault with the people to make. <laughs> Not used to it, after all these years. Do you know, it took me two weeks to understand this concept, layering. <laughs> Ali, it will be cold outside, but warm inside. Layer, Ali, layer. <laughs> but what do I know of this? There's no word for this in AFME, the mere concept. But. Well, they have created this wonder, this. LLB. <laughs> I understand the layering much, much clearer now. <laughs> yes. Cold, but nothing as cold as this shoulder. <laughs> that is the way you say it? The cold shoulder? I was thinking about, I was thinking about an 18 year old boy. Me? No, no not you, another boy 18. Is he handsome and smart? He was. Then it is me. <laughs> no, no this boy lived back where I grew up, Charleston, South Carolina. What you know about Charleston? Oh, I... Couldn't read. Couldn't even sign his own name. No education. Wasn't unique though. Where he lived, people who had all the jobs and opportunity and such, he liked it that way. Liked it for boys, for people like him to stay low. You understand what I'm saying? Low, in their place. Hmm. What do you know of Siad Bar? Mm hmm. Kind of like that, yeah. His folks and farm, 
his folks were slaves, so he was a farmer, like your people. Yes. 18, shared crop, man in the house. Daddy died on that field from a broken heart and broken back. 18 and never could pay back the debt to his landlord that somehow kept rising. Ran away, took his mom and baby sister, stole off in the middle of the night, worked his way on the Atlantic coastline up towards Richmond until finally arriving in New York City. Hall. Langston Hughes, we read, we read. Life for me ain't been no crystal stick. This is hard. Ain't is hard. English. Trying to find things in poems you have no language for in reality. Then creating a new meaning for that which you do not understand in the first place. Ain't. Hasn't been a climbing on. I laughed so hard until I understood. Yes, Langston Hughes. This is not about Langston Hughes? No, my fault. It's not Langston Hughes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Love the city. Found steady work there. Sure, there were some white folks up there who treated him nasty, but none is from where he came. And he was great. Wanted to serve his country. 92nd Infantry Division, Color Division, 1942 to 1945, Buffalo Soldier. Fought in Italy and came back a, a different man. Your father was brave. I think he was. But what do you think? Was waiting for a black war hero when he came home from fighting overseas. <laughs> Jerome, I just... Every time. Every time something happens, and I'm telling you, these people, these people here are salt of the earth. My wife, okay? But as soon as something happens, like that, that boy who stabbed those folks in that mall in Minnesota, or this dude in New York, Jerome. Who they look at you, okay? I see it. Salt of the earth, and they still. You enlist, you get deployed. You serve, you come back, anything, the littlest thing, and they're going to look at you. My father came back home to pitiful pay, visits down south, back of the bus, whites only, entering through back doors, no vote, and they looked at him everywhere, the way they look at you now. In the dark, in the camp, the children would sing this song, choppy in English, sweet in vain. It was. It went. <clears throat> America is the land of opportunity. We'll learn what the American children are doing. We'll do everything on the computer. Our parents are good because they helped us get to the USA and we Give the government of America a high five. <laughs> <laughs> my mother says, in the beginning, when my people first began to flee, no one would take us in. Bantu, psh, they are nothing. They know nothing. They are the slaves of Somalia, sitting there in dusty camps. Australians, no. Italians, no. Tanzania, Malawi, no. Mozambique? But America? Ah, America said yes. And now I know how to recognize the taste of maple syrup. <laughs> Real maple syrup. And smell it, buttery on in my nose. I understand that the best blueberries are grown here in my state. I seen fishermen walk the coast, bringing in crate after crate of lobster, and though I would never think to eat such a thing. <laughs> I see the poetry, yes, 
The poetry in all of it, even in the coldest winter days. Flannel, hiking boots, even when there's nowhere to be hiking. <laughs> this is where I learned to write, read, and love. And I know, I don't want to know no other where as my home but here. And when you come back? When I come back, I will return to this one day. You better not. You better return to something better. Maybe instead of only working during the holidays, they will hire me for one of their office positions. Could be. Could be. Yeah. You are a boss man. Well. You can hire me. Sure. They cannot use my English as an excuse against me like the others. I'll be more of a man. A man who fought for them with a whole new set of skills. Sure. Jerome? I love you, man. I don't think I've said that to another man since my father passed away. But I do. Knowing you since you were this high and not a lick of, I remember that look in your eye when you first got here. Excited and scared all at the same time. And shoot, man, I'm not going to lie. I was happy to see some brown people. <laughs> it's true. I was. <laughs> 26 years and it was just me and that other black dude. <laughs> I was never trying to replace your barber. That, that wasn't my aim, but it was just that your mother would let me come visit with you and just... I know. So when you say you want to do this, I, I get it. I do. But we're talking about more than just your country. We're talking about your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your life. It starts and ends with that. You're 18 years old, Ali. You've been here 10 years. That's not much time. That's not much time at all. And there's a whole world to see. Shit, there's the rest of this goddamn country. I will see the world. I will see the country. Not if you're dead, Ali. This is real. You and Liz, you're not going to be sitting in the office. You know that. You know that. That's the point. You told me once that whenever you walk into a room, you feel as if all of the black people in America, like here in Lewiston, as if all of the black people in the country, you must represent them. How you talk, how hard you work, what you do. This is me now. This is me saying, I am stabbing nobody. I am planting no bombs. Of course I see them, Jerome. I see them look at me. But you don't have to carry that, Ali. Not like this. Can we just... I grew up in this country. There's a way this thing works. I'm just trying to keep you from... Our break is almost over, Jerome. Let's sit and say nice things to each other. While I am gone, you will retire. I imagine so. I imagine so. Man, Clara wanting to be close to her folks, and here I come. Hello, Lewis, man. Man, I must have looked like an alien to these white <laughs> I know we did. Yeah. They were more used to seeing moose up here than black people. <laughs> I love you too, Jerome. I like you. Here. Me too, Ali. Me too.
I have a neighbor, another Conwayan, uh, who I found out not only sells real estate, as a matter of fact, she just, uh, she's offering up the, the town of Heath if anybody wants uh, <laughs> the entire thing. Uh, uh, you see this woman, so, and I found out that she uh, is a songwriter and musician. And again, one of our own. Please welcome Joni Schwartz. Hi there. Hi there. I can only see some of you, but I know you're out there. Um, this is a song that I wrote when I first got to Conway. Some songs write themselves because you're just telling a story about what happened, and this is one of those easy ones. So, uh, This is called, You Can Take Brooklyn Out of the Girl. Or what it is, but 
Uh, I decided to write something where every word began with the letter B uh, for two thirds of this event. And you know, just sort of settled it around Conway, not naming any names or anything. So, well, please uh, forgive me for introducing you to Betty Baker's Buttermilk Biscuit Barn. <laughs> Burn, 
Betty. Bullshit, Bobby! Beautiful brown butter bagel, Bobby. <laughs>
Yes, as Lance Goodshaven's refuge in my latest cinematic masterpiece, The La La Land Love Child. Yes, <laughs> in my latest cinematic masterpiece. Ew, not your cinematic masterpiece, <laughs> you idiot. Mine, Chelmsford Cunningham's cinematic masterpiece. Oh, oh, I'm parched. Oh. You wouldn't, I suppose, have the wherewithal to provide me with a Vante latte, have whole milk, one quarter, one percent, one quarter non fat, extra hot, one and a half shots decaf, two and a half shots regular with whipped cream, two splendor, one sugar in the raw, touch of vanilla syrup, and three short sprinkles of cinnamon. Would you? Could you repeat that? Oh. Oh my. Oh, Larry, yes. quickly, give me my camera lens viewer. Oh, sir. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, 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 yes. <laughs> sir, your viewer. Oh, oh, oh my. Josh Gabor, roll over in your grave and shut the door. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a oh, No, no, no. Luke, fetch. <laughs> oh, 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 my, oh, my. Culturally vacuous kind of way. <laughs> yes, yes, I can make this. This. I can make this a star. Level <laughs> yes. Perfect for the Mongolian monk role. Can you say something in Mongolese? I 
Betty, 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 Betty. Ah, <laughs> Betty, uninspired, but easy to remember. My assistant, Lancelot, will be in contact with you, Bonnie. <laughs> Must run. Oh, sorry I can't stay in here with you, sir, for breakfast. Oh, mon cher. Ta-ta, Beatrice. Bye-bye, <laughs> <laughs> Tomsy Wamsy. <laughs> breakfast? Beautifully baked buttermilk biscuits, B banana bread, bourbon! <laughs> Bolivian blend! Brought beautifully baked buttermilk biscuits, beer brewed, Berkville baked beans. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Out.